Welcome to Below the Line, Griffith University's independent, expert, data-informed analysis of Campaign 2019. On this week's show, we look at more of our seats to watch, the seats of Bonner, Capricornia and Longman. Then we take a look at the Senate race. So much has been discussed over the course of the campaign. The Senate is going to be intriguing and we don't know how long it's going to take to get there in terms of a result. And finally, the campaign itself, the strategies and techniques used to influence your vote. All that ahead in this week's edition of Below the Line. Let's look first at the seat of Longman. John, you've been following this closely. Susan Lamb is the incumbent. She won the seat from Wyatt Roy. Tell us what's going on in this marginal seat that has had the by-election recently. Yes, it's very interesting for a number of reasons. It's, uh, it's had six parliamentary terms, four to the Liberals and two to Labor. Um, it's now got really a first-time member, even though there's been a by-election in there. The margin at the 16 election was uh, 0.8. Um, and one of the reasons for that was she got a lot of One Nation preferences, which she probably won't get this time mm. around. The by-election was stronger, it was about, brings it up to about 4%, but Labor played a very, very strong campaign there. There was every leader from anywhere in Australia was in Longman campaigning to hold that seat because it was very iconic or, mm. or a litmus test for, for the short leadership. Mm. Um, so this time it's, it's a, a different case. I think the LNP probably have a stronger candidate. Mm. He's not a political machine apparatchik, he's a, he's a local retail merchant quite well known in the area. Longman's quite split and divided between um, your retirees who live on the coast and then the, the strong Labour strongholds around the, basically around the freeway, around mm, the Bruce Highway mm, mm. Uh, up, up in those areas. And uh, I think it's going to be a tight contest. I think num a number of people, Longman was left off the list and, and we haven't seen a lot of mm, senior mm. Labour people in the electorate, yep, nor yep. in Dixon, yep. which is next door. Yep. Um, so I think she's fighting on her own. She's running around the campaign with a mobile office and getting some attention. A lot of people say they haven't seen the Liberal candidate. But remember, most of the other candidates, there's about nine candidates in Longman, most of them are right of centre, and so most of them will probably drift their preferences, like the UAP, will drift their preferences back to uh, the LNP. Mm. So it'll be a tough contest for Labour to hold. Yeah, a very tough contest for Labor to hold and such a diverse electorate as you pointed out. Uh, extraordinary population growth, those congestion mm. challenges. challenges. But I would have thought that for young um, commuters, young families, issues of childcare, uh, the, some of the housing affordability policies that Labor has brought out. How do you think some of the policy issues will play? Jenny, I might throw to you on that. Um, it's, it's hard to say, just because that there's been such a strong scare campaign from the LNP side of politics, you would think it would have some appeal. You'd think that Susan Lamb would appeal to that demographic. She mm. is of that area and of that age group. Um, so it, 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 on the policy front, I think that Labor has a lot more to offer to that electorate than the LNP. So it'll come down to the... But, but we had some earlier polls from, from Dixon, which is the next door seat, and their three main areas was cost of living, which was about a 60% um, uh, concern, followed by he health, and then followed by sincerity in government, trust in government. Uh, education was way down. Health is a big employer mm. in Longman. I think it's the biggest it's single employer. It's a very employer, big employer. And it's a very feminised employer. Yep. Uh, so, yep. you know, it will resonate in, in the area. But congestion is another issue yep. for, for, for that electorate. Well, Tracy, I was going to come to you on the sort of the gender question mm. uh, in, in that seat uh, because, you know, Susan Lamb is running. There's almost, uh, you know, and, and they had a young can they had a young member in terms of Wyatt Roy. Mm. Uh, you know, how do you think, um, you know, the, the my mum uh, moment last week, some of the other sort of gender dynamics, uh, you know, Scott Morrison's late kind of effort to enlist the female vote, you know, for the voters of Longman, do those things matter? Uh, well, I think it's been really interesting seeing the reaction on social media about the um, the own goal by the News Corp people who mm. actually put out that, um, that press release about um, Shorten's mother. Um, whether that resonates with the voters of Longman ahead of those other issues, those, those real life factors that I think all the electorates and you know, people in those sorts of electorates are dealing with. But I think it's one of those things that builds on the concern that the LNP doesn't 
um, work well with women. So it, it, I don't think it's going to be a major factor, but I think it's again one of those other kind of emblematic pointers mm. that you know this is a continual problem. Mm. And people you know. will remember the seat of Longman was the catalyst for the Queensland LNP led push against Malcolm Turnbull. But it mm. seems those leadership issues have really yeah. dissipated in this campaign. Yeah. Let's move on then to the seat of Bonner on the other side of the river. On the other Tracy, side of the river. Tracy, you've been taking a look at the seat of Bonner. Tell us all about it. Bonner is held currently by the LNP's Ross Vaster on 3.4%. Um, Vaster has held that seat, well, he won it in 2004, held it till 2007, was um, voted out with the Rudd government's, you know, massive landslide win, and then again reclaimed it in 2010 and has held it ever since. Um, it's an inner East Brisbane seat. It covers um, suburbs like the Port of Brisbane, Wynnum, Manly, Tingalpa, um, Carindale, Mount Gravatt. So it's got that kind of, you know, some industrial areas, but also a lot of suburban areas in it. And I think, um, once again, the same kind of factors that play out in, in seats like Dixon and things like that play out here. Childcare pressures, um, some transport, um, particularly rail mm, transport issues been a big have issue been happening that there. Yeah. Um, that's, it's interesting though, when you look at Vasta, who is a conservative um, liberal, um, he supported um, the Dutton push. Um, he voted against the same-sex marriage plebiscite where his electorate voted 62% in favour of mm. it. Um, you know, I'm not sure whether that will resonate this time around with the voters, but what I have heard from people on the ground there is that the LNP presence seems to be um, quite reduced, like mm. they're not seeing this huge LNP presence in the, in the electorate this time around. Mm. And there's a couple of seats where they really do seem to, and I mean this is both parties are having to decide, and we talked about this last week, where they spend their resources, um, but they really do seem to have almost conceded Ford is this a bit the same? You know, I think if the if the swing to Labor goes the right way, um, I think it's definitely one to watch. Mm. Mm. Great. Well, I mean, you know, in lots of ways, the issues are very similar to others that we've that we've talked about. Um, you know, gentrification, um, the mortgage belt, uh, you know, retirees in some of those. I mean, these, you know. One of the big issues of the campaign, I think, and we might come to this later, is how do you hold these incredibly fragmented and diverse constituencies together? And those differences are only becoming greater. Thoughts on that? It's interesting because, you know, a decade or 15 years ago, you would have in Brisbane, you know, Labor seats and Blue Ribbon Liberal seats. And I, I, for a long time, lived in Brisbane Central, which was a Labor seat, now it's gentrified. And mm. this has happened all over Brisbane. Yeah. And it makes it very hard to, to call, and it's not going to wind back. So they're always just going to be split 50-50. Mm. Gentrification is a factor, but yeah. so also is the fragmentation of the parties. Mm. I mean, we've gone from having, um, you know, in the 60s and 70s, effectively about 10 parties, and most of those didn't count. We had the Democrats rising in, in the 70s and the like. We've now got something like 60 parties standing in the Senate, and, mm. and, uh, and it's fragmenting on the right. So we've got very few parties on the left, the Greens possibly. Yeah. Mm. Occasionally we've got some progressive element, uh, yeah. you know, more or less an independent, mm. uh, but the vast majority of, of the tail of the parties is on the right wing and that's fragmenting that vote and they're appealing to various components of that. So things like um, overseas migration is a big issue in Dixon and Longman and yet it's not an electorate particularly affected by that. So mm. here's an issue that's resonating mm. but it's not actually that empirical on the ground. Yeah, it's, it's fascinating. Um, the independents and small parties in, in uh, Long, uh, Bonner? There's six candidates in Bonner. I think the ones to really watch that will be in competition with Vasta is the Labor candidate and the Greens candidate. Both have stood in state electorates before, so you know, for, for so state recognition, seats. Name recognition. Um, so there's some recognition there. Um, they're, the, they're the main ones, I think, that will be in competition to him, and he's preferencing um, um, the Labor Party third. So, yes. So, and yeah. this has been something on uh, the the tickets and the material that I'm receiving in Brisbane. The United Australia Party getting the second preference. There's no there's no party names, of course. But yeah, that's right. There's just the uh, the it's names of the, the names. candidates, and that's how it's going to be strategically targeted. Which brings this journey to the seat of Capricornia, uh, in the the mining heartland uh, of of Queensland. Um, 
um, you know, where there's been so much focus, way far thin margin. Uh, Michelle Landry, Michelle Landry, who doesn't seem to be able to keep the leadership of the National Party kind of on a leash when she does um, when she does media commentary or answers questions. Could anyone at the moment? Could have, well, I, I guess so. But um, but she does seem particularly undisciplined in that stuff, doesn't she? Um, What's going on in Capricornia? Labor were optimistic. I'm hearing that they're getting concerned. Uh, Capricornia was one of those seats, uh, Queensland seats, six months ago that was going to roll Labor into power. And it's trickling away as we speak. Um, so Michelle Landry won it in 2013 and then again in 2016. But it had been a long-term Labor seat. Mm. So it's one of those mixed Queensland seats where you have you know, a rural city in Rockhampton and then it goes into the hinterland. Uh, big coal seats, so there's a strong Labor vote in places like Collinsville and Dysart and Moranbar. Mm. And then you get the agricultural pastoral areas around Claremont, which is a strong LNP vote, and then split down the middle in Rockhampton. Mm. Um, Do you think the miners will still vote, vote Labor? Because I, uh, I suspect quite a lot of them now are tradies and they will, they will be looking to yeah, the importance in, of coal yeah. and regional development and that might split. And that interland that Capricornia has is now massive. It, it nearly goes halfway across the state. It's, yeah, it's a huge... Yeah. Big West indigenous Island. issues there yeah. too, of course. Well, well Labor's candidate, uh, Russell Robertson, is a third generation miner from Warren Bar. Mm. So mm. Labor has picked the candidate mm. for that seat. Mm. He signed the pledge. Um, uh, so hopefully, I mean, you, you just couldn't have, you know, a left-leaning woman in that seat, I don't think. I think they've got the right sort of candidate. Um, it's tricky because there's nine, you know, nine candidates mm -hmm. and you have the full run. What is in play there, not necessarily in play in other seats, is the Cata Australia Party. Mm -hmm. So they mm -hmm. actually gained 7.1% um, of the vote at the last election. Yeah, and we've, uh, there's been very little talk about them in the national coverage, has there? But they were such a force in the state campaign and they really have, uh, you know, I think, been, been much more disciplined and better mm. organised than the mm. other minor parties. And we saw that in the minority Queensland yeah. Parliament. And on the latest news poll, they're polling way more than Palmer. Mm. Um, Palmer is in other, not, not even as a, as a separate party. And so where party. will their preferences and, go? And 11% in Queensland now in seats like Longman, they got 17% at the last by-election mm. and, and really run very little of a campaign. Mm. And how do, they, how do their preferences split? Well, their preferences will split for largely for the LNP. Remember last time in 16, One Nation probably made a political mistake by always voting against sitting members. They didn't look at who the sitting member was and whether they could live with that sitting member or what. They just voted against and that. That affected all, all the sitting members' votes. It, it dragged percentages off mm. all the sitting members, which is why we saw something like 15 or 16 seats change hands in that election. So, Jenny, you said that um, you know, Labor's hopes in Capricornia mm. are, are dwindling. Mm. <laughs> you, and, and this is always the way, isn't it? So much hope than Queensland yeah, receives, right. you know, <laughs> as it kind of gets back to the, but to closer to the um, actual polling day. What, what accounts for that? It is one of those Adani seats. And I do think that the caravan of hope or whatever <laughs> it was called. Caravan was, of courage. <laughs> caravan of courage. The, was really a turning point for a yeah. lot of people in, the, in those central seats. And so we've discussed this before, mm. but really it, I think it just put a lot of people off. They don't want to be told how to vote. And yeah. I think from that stage, it's just come back a bit and the preferences, as John says, will actually support Michelle Landry. And so uh, most of those parties, except for the Greens, uh, will yeah. probably preference her. And the Greens only had 4.7% 4, 4 of the vote at the last election there, which, so it's not going to get Which Labor just tells line. you, doesn't it, about the, the sort of extraordinary disjuncture as we talked about last week. A, a, and I mean, you know, there'll be a temptation for people to say, oh, you know, Queensland parochialism or whatever. But, but there, it really does, I think, crystallise the extraordinary economic differences and drivers yeah. mm. in different parts of Australia. And for me, that's just, you know, really a, a barometer of those differences. And it's, just a what di a policy it's a different election is. depending on where, on you, where you are. Mm. And, and, and the major parties try and straddle that by running two campaigns, one for, you know, inner city, Melbourne, and one for central Queensland, and you just can't do that in this day and age. No, no, not in the year of social media, and, you know, it, it might have worked once when, you know, you just had your person on the back of a truck talking about your electorate, but yeah. not anymore. No, I don't think it works so well. Which brings us to, of course, what I think is going to be the most watched contest um, on Saturday night, uh, voting in the Senate. We're going to take a look now at the whole issue of voting in the Senate, how to go about doing it, uh, and how to direct your preferences, whether you um, vote above or below the line. What is voting below the line? 
There are two options for filling out your white ballot paper for the Australian Senate. You can vote above the line based on the party or below the line for individual candidates. Above the line, number at least six choices or if voting below the line, you must number at least 12 choices. Either way, you can choose more than the recommended number and the more you choose, the better. If you don't fill out enough boxes, there's a chance that the parties can decide where your vote goes. Due to above the line voting, some senators are elected with very low personal votes. In 2016, One Nation Senator Malcolm Roberts took his seat after receiving just 77 below the line first preference votes. He was later replaced by Fraser Anning, who only received 19 votes. They won their places based on the number of votes for their party. Understandably, places high on the party's Senate ticket are highly coveted by politicians chasing one of each state's six Senate seats. When voting for the Senate, consider voting below the line. The number of candidates might be daunting, but it gives you more say about who makes up this powerful House of Parliament. So there's been a huge focus on the Senate, but really what's going to happen when you confront a ballot paper with 83 names on it? How should you go about approaching your task as a voter? Our chief explainer, Jacob Deem, takes a look. The Senate is a really important chamber in the Australian Parliament. It's not where we decide who forms government, that happens in the House of Representatives, but we traditionally think of the Senate as a house of review because senators have the opportunity to scrutinise bills or proposed legislation and they also have the opportunity to hold the government to account and to question ministers. That makes it really important to think about who gets elected into the Senate because they hold their positions for six years, they've got a, they're in there for a really long time, and it means it's important to really make sure that the person that you vote for really reflects your views and your interests. The way that senators are elected operates a little bit differently to the way that we elect members of parliament into the House of Representatives. Broadly, the Senate operates on a proportionate model, which aims to allocate seats in the Senate uh, according to the percentage of voters who want that particular party or that candidate. We've got 12 senators per state and two senators for each of the ACT in the Northern Territory. In a regular election or a half Senate election, six of those senators in each state go up for election. That means that each seat that's uh, up for grabs is worth about 14% of the vote. And so that's the quota that parties will be aiming for in order to win one or more seats in this election. That quota is really important for major parties because they typically can expect to receive 30 plus percent of the vote. So they'll be hoping for two, maybe even three seats each if they're lucky. But it's also really important for minor and micro parties as well because they might struggle themselves to reach that 14% threshold, but with preferences from other smaller parties, that might be enough to get them over the line. A good example of that was Pauline Hanson's One Nation Party. In the 2016 election, because it was a full Senate election following the double dissolution, the quota was halved, so they only needed about 7% of the vote. They got 9% overall, which meant that they were able to hold two seats in the Senate. But this time around, if they got a similar number, they wouldn't, that wouldn't reach the threshold at all. They wouldn't qualify for any seats. Despite the challenges of meeting that 14% threshold, we do see a lot more minor and micro parties contesting for seats in the Senate rather than the House of Representatives because the 14% threshold is much easier to reach than the 50% threshold for a seat in the House of Representatives. It's been really interesting the past couple of elections to see just the plethora of micro parties, single issue parties and independent candidates all competing for a protest vote against the established or major parties. We see a lot of parties, especially on the right wing of politics, really springing up to try and capture voter uh, dissatisfaction with the major parties' policies around some working class issues around immigration. And what's going to be really interesting in this election is to see how those parties compete for what is a similar voter base. In Queensland, there's 83 candidates seeking election. So they've 
voters are going to be confronted with a really big choice on their hands and a huge number of parties who they probably have never heard before. And their task is going to be to pick amongst them to decide who should get the Senate seat. What's really important for voters is to do a little bit of research before they go into the polling booth to work out which parties do or don't align with them. It's not always possible to tell just from a party's title or logo what their main policies are. A good example of this is the Sustainable Australia Party, which sounds like a very left-wing, progressive party that's pro-environment and might pitch itself as an alternative to the Greens. However, when you dig down into their policies, yes, they are for environmental protection, but one of their key st proposed strategies for doing that is to reduce immigration numbers. A lot of people who would be tempted to vote for environmental sustainability are likely to sit on the left end of the political spectrum and are probably going to be pro-immigration. And so the party's policies wouldn't align with that voter's values. Accordingly, it's really important for voters to carefully research who they would like to vote for and to make sure that those parties align with their own values. So John, the last election it was a double dissolution and the dynamics are very different at a half Senate election. Talk to us about what we can expect to see this time and how those technical aspects um, contrast between the double dissolution and a half Senate. Well, the way we count in the uh, Senate is we have a, prefer a, a proportional uh, vote and we've had that since the uh, 49 election. So that means everybody in Queensland votes for the same list of senators, where, which is different from the lower house where you vote for your local constituency member. So that's mm. one thing. But the way we count when it, when it comes and we look at a Queensland electorate serve about 3 million, we're looking at a quota because there's six senators standing this time of around about half a million each. Um, so uh, the way we work that out is, is a formula by how many electors are in your state voting mm. as a whole, mm. not split up, mm. and, how and then plus one. So you've got to get that quota. So that's about 14.3% of the vote. So any candidate in the Senate or party who gets 14.3 gets one. If they get 28.6, they get two. Mm. If they get into the 30s, they've got a, a quota left over. They don't have quite a quota. And then what happens is from the bottom, we pick up the votes of the lower candidates who, who've, and parties who finished last, and we eliminate those and count their preferences back in to see who eventually gets a quota. That's why usually with, this, with a, a six-seat Senate election, half Senate, we find four people get elected pretty soon, and we know that probably within a, a, by, by Sunday, Monday. Yeah. And then there might be a week or 10 days uh, before we find the others because there's a very, very complex preference flow about who drops out first. If, if you and I were going and you're three votes ahead of me, I will drop out and, and, and my preferences will go maybe to you or to, or to Jenny. Yeah. So that, that's the way it goes, so it's bottom up mm, and that, for mm, those last mm, two positions. Mm. So that's why it's quite complicated. Yeah. Um, and the, big, the other big difference with the Senate uh, is the change in the rules in the last time, making above the line six votes or, six vo or up to six votes and below the line 12. So if you vote above the line, the parties allocate their pref your preferences, not you. So yeah. They've already I think that's a crucial point yeah. for people to understand. Yeah. The parties yeah. have recorded their preferences in with the Electoral Commission, Commission. and they're, they're available in the booths if people turn up to booths. They're available there, you can look at them. So if you want to vote, say, Green, you can look at where the Greens will be allocating their, mm -hmm. their subsequent party votes. What that means, say, for example, that the Labour Party and the LNP, is that if they get more than two quotas, which they will probably will do, get, yeah. Yeah. their preferences will, will Labour's will probably get a Green up, yeah. and then the LNP may get uh, UAP up, UAP up uh, yeah. because th th it's the party who's allocating the preferences. In the, in the lower house, yes, we get how to vote cards, but you in the booth determine your preferences. You don't have to follow the cards. You can make your own up as long as you number the, the boxes. But in the Senate, you don't have to follow the cards either if you vote under the line. Yes, right. but the party... So, yes, so the rule right. change yes. around that this time, Tracy, is something I think you should explain for people. But, but under the line, we, it's, in Queensland it would be t less than 10%. And the only two places in Australia where it's about 20% is the ACT and Tasmania, where they're used to a hair clerk voting for the individual candidate model. Sure, sure. Okay. But I think perhaps these changes where instead of if you vote below, below the line, you in the past you had to fill out every single square, Nowadays, you only have to fill out a minimum of 12. So you can vote 12 below the line and be absolutely guaranteed to know that that where you put your 12 votes is the preferences that mm. will be counted. And I think that people will be motivated about that this time after the Fraser Anning 19 primary uh, votes uh, kind exactly. of question, or at least people who are, are very engaged in politics. Jenny, 
We've seen this extraordinary fragmentation, particularly on the right, uh, of, uh, you know, and many of those candidates brought to us by Pauline Hanson actually at one time or another uh, in the past. Um, how well do the candidates running for the Senate understand the House's role, do you think? I don't, uh, not very well. So Jacob mentioned that the Senate is a house of review. And what it seems to me happens is that there's a real disconnect between being part of a protest party or one issue party and what the Senate actually does. Mm. So the Senate does a lot of very kind of technical detailed review of legislation um, and can make amendments and then you can send it back to the House of Representatives. So these people arrive there without really an understanding. They see it as a platform uh, for, for their views, but that is really not the day-to-day -day work that they'll be doing in the Senate. So you end up by getting some of those um, Pauline Hanson stunts with the Burke or whatever, bringing it back to her issues because she doesn't have an opportunity in the Senate to talk about those issues. But I think that what drives them into is a transactional style of yep, politics. Yep. Um, so whoever and unpack wins that for people because, of course, if as some of us think there could be a, a minority parliament mm. uh, on uh, on Saturday night. This transactional style, there's a platform created for the transactional style. Yes, yeah, so whoever wins will have to deal with uh, this kind of um, probably controlling group in the Senate. And what they like to do is to, and it, it's a bit like American politics where each vote you kind of, you do, you do a deal. So, um, all right, well, I'll support this piece of legislation, your budget or whatever, if you agree to reduce funding for the ABC, which again, I think is one Pauline Hanson has done. So you're, you're locking your issues onto a piece of legislation that mightn't even be kind of related to that legislation. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so you get this thing where you're kind of doing these transactional deals. So wh whoever is in part, it, it comes into government, I think needs to be careful not to go down that path because mm. I think that's a big danger for Australian political life. Two, two quick points. One, a lot of the Senate work is in committees. So a lot of the mm. time, you know, they're not sitting in the chamber, they're yes. in committees. Yes. And that is hard work. And yes. you're trying to work out compromises, negotiations, and a lot of these, uh, the, the micro kind of people aren't, aren't on board. And often no. they don't turn up no. and don't volunteer well. for that. Uh, and, and the second point I'd make is that um, if, if you look at the Senate vacancies, the ones who are coming up, that, that is half the senators who got elected yep. in, in 16 stay, mm. and half in the, in the territory people come up. The net result is likely to be one gain for Labor, one loss to a Liberal, and the big questions will be whether Sarah Hansen Young in South Australia gets back, and whether Palmer gets here or whether One Nation gets here. Well, the point is well made about turning up, doing committee work and so on, because Palmer found it very difficult to turn up uh, in the House of Representatives uh, As a and, and one has almost never seen One Nation or minor party people on Senate estimates which is of course one of the most important com mm. you know, committee processes that the Senate goes through. Um, I just wanted to touch quickly before we move on, oh, we've almost got a generational change in the major parties, some very controversial um, disendorsements of Senate or long term senators, admittedly they are getting a bit long in the tooth, Barry O'Sullivan, uh, 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 and Ian MacDonald, uh, who never goes quietly, uh, no matter whether right. it's into the uh, into the ministry or whatever. And then on Labor's side, of course, people like Claire Moore, who Cameron. are leaving after mm. a long, the, and Cameron. Cameron. Mm. Yes. I've, I've oh, Doug Cameron, yeah, you're yeah, talking. Yeah, yes, yeah. sure. Um, so, you know, some, some big names leaving the parliament. And, of course, in New South Wales, we're seeing Jim Molan, who, who's in an unwinnable spot, mm -hmm. uh, you know, almost campaigning independently. Mm. All right, well, does anybody want to predict what the Senate's going to look like? Oh, no. Oh, God. Go on, John. <laughs> have, a, think, have a go. I think the crossbench, that is the non... Uh, coalition non-Labour is probably going to be about 18. I think mm -hmm. they're going to lose a couple. They've lost Lionholm already and, and I don't think the uh, Liberal Democrats will get that place back in New South Wales. They'll probably lose one more. So it's touch and go whether, say, one nation gets back in Western Australia. And what are Palmer's prospects? I think he's quite good. I think quite good, mainly because... More ahead of one nation? So yeah, I think, I think, I think in, the, in the ballot. Although his, his polls are going down at the moment, he's peaked too early, peaked in the middle of the campaign. And he's well, gone to Fiji. Fiji. Yes, that's right, that's right. That's, that's a, um, but I think, an urgent error. I think if he gets around eight or nine, he will he will survive by LNP preferences. By LNP preferences, and then that's of course something that Labor has really doable. ramped that's, up that's in this last doable. week. Yeah. But the, the, the One Nation will also be fighting for that place. If they get 11% or 12%, 
um, depending on preference flows to them, yeah. that's going to be quite competitive and it might be a neck and neck struggle between One Nation and... And, uh, um, and it doesn't allow them... The, uh, we think the Greens will pick up one? Probably oh, will well, with we think Labor. So. With, and with Larissa yeah. Waters. I mean, uh, Waters is reasonably well known. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Deputy I think leader. so too. Yep. Co-Deputy Leader? Of course, campaigns can be incredibly unpredictable and leaders always need to have up their sleeve the potential to have a diversion. That is sometimes known as the dead cat strategy. Jenny Menzies explains. Political parties like to control media conversations, particularly during election campaigns. However, sometimes they lose control of the narrative and resort to desperate measures to shift attention. One such strategy is known as throwing a dead cat on the table, also known as a dead cat strategy. The term describes a manoeuvre to regain control by throwing a more shocking issue into the mix, distracting people from the topic the party wants to avoid. Everyone becomes fixated on the dead cat and the issue that was causing the party grief will fade into the background. This kind of diversionary tactic becomes critical in the heightened atmosphere of an election campaign, but it only works if the right elements are in place to shift the opponents from their preferred ground to your ground. Firstly, the dead cat must be a topic that is irresistible to the media, something tantalising and negative that will appeal to their audiences. Secondly, it must also be something of general interest and easily understandable. Thirdly, it can't be done by the leader, but instead should be offered up by a more junior minister or shadow minister. While a dead cat strategy might be the best way to avoid debate, and derail the opponent's momentum, it can also be risky. Voters can be put off by negative campaigning and as much as you might shift the focus in the short term, you never know when a dead cat might be thrown in your direction. You know, we're getting close ourselves to the end of this grand final edition. Yes. And it would not be responsible for us not to really have a look at the campaign itself. It's been a really dirty and unpleasant campaign, which we very expected. Negative. Yeah. Very negative, very personal, um, and very, actually, the rhythms of it so disrupted by these extraordinary pre-poll figures that are now up around 2.7 million, is that right? Some the, the latest yeah. numbers. So Tracy, attack ads, misinformation, scare campaigns. We've seen Sum it all, it up. Sum it up for it me, please, in terms of the tactics and strategies of both sides. Yeah, it's no wonder that people get completely fed up with politics. You know, with this campaign, um, you know, people that care about the issues and actually want to find out information, they've really got to, they've really got to look for it. Because if you just look at, you know, the the ads and things like that. There isn't a great deal of this is what we're going to do. It's more about this is what they're going to do and that's going to be really bad for you. Mm. You, you know, and your family. particularly on the LNP side, I have to say, yes. um, you know, it's been all about um, higher taxes um, and 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 yet not really explaining, apart from on the very odd campaign launch day where he did actually announce very quickly his new um, pay payments for um, young people and, and first home. Um, you know, reducing the deposit needed to five percent. Um, it's been it's been a very sort of personal um, political leader, and on the LNP side, you haven't really got a sense of the team. Mm. You know, there's been no you know the environment minister's missing in action. You know, isn't coming out to discuss anything. Um, and I can understand in a way because of all the issues that they've had leading up to this and the instability there why that might be the case but nonetheless it's been a very Morrison led mm, show mm, mm. which um, considering his recognition was actually pretty poor mm. um, is a risky strategy but he's campaigned very well I mean for what it is he's campaigned very I, I well. think he's a very good campaigner yes. and I think you know he, he gets out and meets and greets and I think, you know, it's quite personable like that. But most politicians are when you meet them in person. I, I think, think the big difference right. in this election from, say, the last one is um, uh, we've often had people running for the Prime Minister's office. And, and remember, a lot of people do vote presidentially and yes. we run campaigns yeah, yeah, presidentially. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mm. Um, we've, we've had le uh, leaders we've liked 
Bob Hawke would be a good example of that. We've had leaders we respected, even though we didn't particularly like them. Mm. Paul Keating, John Howard might be in that mm. category. And we knew what they stood for. And we knew what they stood for. And, yeah. and there was a substantial proportion of the electorate who liked Turnbull. This time we've got two leaders who we neither like nor respect. And that's, that's turned the campaign yeah. very negative. Yeah. We don't usually have negative campaigns. America has ignored extraordinarily negative well, campaigns. Well, Tony Abbott arguably had a negative campaign. He had a very... A damaging campaign on Labour at the time mm, with, with mm, his three, you know, three, mm, three slogans. slogans. It's kind yeah. of where the rot really set in, I think. You know, in lots of ways, his, um, you know, his complete that negative, yeah, three-word mm. slogans. I've seen one positive campaign, and that was from LNP. I've seen one positive campaign message uh, broadcast. Mm. Uh, all the rest have been negative. So, Jenny, inevitably after the campaign, there'll be uh, the party postmortems. Mm. Not that I ever have confidence that they learn anything from them, but putting that to one side, there'll also be the review by the Joint Standing Committee of Electoral Matters, which reviews the conduct um, of elections. Um, the pre poll voting, I think, will have to be a major issue in that review. What do you, what do you think it, it should look at, and uh, you know, in light of what we've seen this time? Uh, the pre polling is interesting because that's actually been kind of escalating for the last couple mm. of elections mm. um, so it but it's reached peak this time and it will have to be looked at because it's such um, a large lot of resources by the Electoral Commission mm. and all the parties to try and man all those pre-polling booths for three weeks it's hard enough to man the booth on election day uh, I think on the kind of the wash up from the campaign it's interesting the two different campaigns are, I see Labor's as a a very military sort of campaign. You can see that they've looked at the terrain and they've eradicated any issues. So they said, <laughs> someone go and see, you know, Hawkey and Keating and get them together for a cup of tea. And someone has to see, you know, Julia and Kevin because they have to sit together. So they've, they've looked at the horizon and, and tried to smooth all that over. Whereas um, with Scott Morrison, he hasn't even tried to paper over those cracks. Mm. Uh, he hasn't tried to get people together in the room, so he's he's out there as a solo performer, mm. whereas Labor has really pushed the team. The team. Perhaps he's that's him. Sorry, sorry. Go I ahead. I was just wondering. Perhaps that's because, though, it's relatively recently that the cracks appeared in comparison to Labor, who's had a few years to kind of get over yeah. themselves a bit. And I, and I just think they have been strategic. They've looked out there. They've decided to do a policy-rich campaign, yeah. um, which probably might be the first one since about uh, John Hewson and fight back in 1993. Yeah, and, and may well prove to pick up the same kind of opprobrium mm. that, that went with that because it's exposed them to, uh, you mm. know, being a big target instead of a small target has created some difficulties for them with different constituencies, yes. But I, but I think they have made a, a, a number of uh, constituencies angry, but yes. I think there's been a calculation by people like Chris Bowen and Jim Chalmers that they, these people didn't vote for them anyway. Yes. So that there is anger out there yeah. amongst these the yeah. groups. Um, they're just hoping that the goodies they offer, the free goodies they offer to the rest of the electorate will, will pull them over the, over the line. The other big thing that might come out of a review is, is campaign funding. Absolutely. Um, we've tied it up to some extent, the campaign funding from donations, uh, donations and stuff, and that is meant to be the citizens making um, a contribution to the political parties. We give them public funding once the election's over by how many votes they get. But this election, we've seen Palmer spending 55 million of his own money. He's yep. not asking for donations. No. It is a personal investment uh, to get into politics, to get to buy a seat or to buy influence. Yep. He will get some of that back yep. for his, his deposits for, for a lot of his candidates, yep. and he will also get some funding for. Um, for, for the votes. Yep. Um, so the issue is, will the, the main parties, who are a cartel, will the main parties actually try to uh, restrict or prohibit how much we can spend, total limits on spending? Uh, because a lot of people think he's wasting a lot of money, he's not really doing much for democracy, and, and, and the, the public funding we give is to recontest the next election with your administration. Mm. Is he going to recontest is going or to is he recontest? just going to pocket it like yeah. Pauline Hanson did for me? Yeah, years. sure. Yeah. And I mean, I guess, you know, for me, what's really interesting uh, about this campaign donations uh, piece is we don't have real time donations in the Commonwealth. We have them in Queensland at the state election and at council elections. You can actually see, and we've made reforms so that that's the case. Yeah. Many of us, you know, understood from our research with Liberal Party operatives that they were very skinny uh, in terms of funding, there actually seems to have been a, a 
big influx of money, and it'd be very interesting to know where that's come from. On the, the, on the left, you know, there's a lot of concern about get-ups, fundraising capacity, and so on. So I think real-time donations has got to be the elephant mm -hmm. in the room, hasn't it? Yep. Um, of, apart from pre-poll voting of what, of what, needs, to be, um, what needs to be considered. Um, final observations, Tracy. Oh, I think it's going to be a very interesting night on Saturday night. I think, um, I hope in a way that this, um, you know, that the Labor Party are not punished too much for being brave because I think it's really important that, that, that we hear about what they plan to do. And they seem to have moved from the shorter term, you know, three year electoral cycle thing to a much longer term for some of their policies. They're actually looking at out, you know, up to 10 years, I think, in some of the policies and certainly the climate change things mm. that, you know, people ostensibly care about. So I think, you know, hopefully that will be encouraged because I think it's better for democracy if all the major parties who have a real chance of being government actually can articulate what they're going to do next time, mm. not just campaign on what the other fellow, you know, m might do, but this is what I intend to do going out. Yeah, and I think, you know, Morrison's lack of an agenda has, you know, well, it's in the budget paper you know, has been their defence, but then they pull something out of the economic team uh, that hasn't been to Cabinet in terms of that, yeah. that rate yeah. thing. But the it's economy is weird. his strongest card, uh, yeah. by, by far. I mean, he, he really doesn't have much else. To run on. Well, yeah. stop the boats and, and the yeah. economy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the other thing is, in terms of the campaign, we've seen an enormous focus on, on the leader, far more than, than in previous ones. There's always been the yeah. leader for yeah. But the, the media has, has just been obsessed with that leadership, and I don't think that's changed many votes. And then below that, we've seen a, a very intense seat-by-seat seat fight. Now, mm. I, I think that's probably in Australia down to about 20 to 25 seats. Mm. In some seats, the parties have given up. They're not spending any resources. No. They're not even they're not even ha handing out you know the normal things that come in your letterbox with mm. fridge magnets and yeah. the like. Just yeah. they're not spending the money because they mm. they've, they've conceded they're mm. not going to win mm. that seat. Mm. And then the third level of the campaign is this social media stuff, which is almost out of control. Uh, people making up fake news, all yeah. sorts of yeah. things. You know, yeah. Chinese are going to capture Western oh, Australia. Yeah. All, all this yeah. kind of stuff. Um, and, and of course the parties have suffered from that because they've elected candidates, often in seats they didn't expect to win, who've got these nutty views mm, out there mm, and they've mm. had to disendorse them. Yep. And the, in a couple of seats, one Labour and one, um, one Liberal, they've, ha they've had a candidate who had a really good chance of winning and they've had to disendorse, had to disendorse them. them. And so we're, yeah. we're seeing that in Melbourne and uh, Lyons. And maybe Morrison trying to get them to, you know, declare before polling day is a mistake. And we know how Abbott blew it in, uh, in 2010 in terms of the negotiations. We've seen that before too. Jenny, final observation. Uh, well, following on from what John said, I think, um, I can remember when uh, Julia Gillard was elected and, 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 it, and it was a minority government and there was a lot of kind of shock because we weren't used to that mm. in, in the federal sphere, though more so at the state. I think, again, this is going to be very close, could be a hung parliament, but I think it, it also kind of shows the end of an era where big swings were, were uh, available mm. to parties. You'd push one out and you'd have a huge majority and you'd hang on to that for a couple of terms and then it would swing back. Again, that's still happening at the state level. It seems to have disappeared uh, from the federal arena and I think it'll give something for political scientists to think about for some time to come. Nicely done. Um, well, uh, that is about it for the grand final edition of Griffith University's Below the Line. Uh, my thanks to the panel, uh, uh, to our explainers, uh, and uh, of course to our talented production team and crew. Uh, it's been a lot of fun. All that remains is for those of you who haven't pre-poll voted to turn out on the 18th of May, to be glued to your televisions, to see what happens, uh, and to exercise your democratic right. Uh, and we encourage you to do that in, a, in an informed way.